Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to open this forum on behalf of Jean-Paul Vermes, the president of the Chambre de Commerce et d'Industrie de, de Paris, Ile-de-France. It's very uh, re rewarding and very honored to open a forum on this theme about uh, the new challenges facing the investment management industry. Very happy to be here with Jean-Michel Bicot and Marie Brière, chairman of the scientific committee. This forum gives us the opportunity to remind one of our very main priorities. We need the development of a competitive financial community on our territory. The Paris Hill de France Chamber of Commerce and Industry, speaking on behalf of our enterprises and as a major operator in management education, supports the Louis Bachelier Institute initiatives to strengthen the financial industry through innovation and networking. Paris, as a world-class uh, city, capital city, needs to have a real financial influence, and your institute plays a key role in spreading and highlighting French research in these fields. On our side, we are very proud to say that our management and business schools are substantial contributors to research, to research in finance. This year, your forum focused, focuses on the question of new challenges facing the investment management industry. We know for sure that your keynote topic is once again this year right in line with current events. Heavy turbulences shaking the financial markets this year has offered yet another reminder that the risk that threaten the world's financial stability remain manifold and powerful. As at end uh, 2015, the financial markets were wondering how to cope with the prospect of a slow but steady rise in US interest rates. Today, three months, not, not even three months after, the, the questions have to do with the long-term impact of what promises to be a protracted period of negative interest rates in Europe. Many hoped that monetary policy would go back to normal, but the Central European Bank has taken its non-conventional policies even further to assuage the stock markets. Many hoped that the international monetary system has achieved a form of stability through fine, finely tuned steering of market anticipation on the euro dollar exchange rate. But China's economic slowdown, steering the temptation to manipulate yuan exchange rates, have ushered in a new era with three global currencies. For our enterprises, the financial market's concern is not a good sign. We are concerned as, as uh, the risk of deflation rise, entailing major risks on their profit margins. Our enterprises know that with the new financial regulation, they will be increasingly reliant on the markets for financing. How can investors today stand up to the challenge of the digital revolution if financial markets because become increasingly volatile? I am therefore strongly convinced that your deliberations during these two days concerning such fascinating and fundamental issues will be of great importance, and I am sure you will open way to solutions. Thank you sincerely for your kind attention, and the floor is yours, Mary. Thank you. As the chairman of the Scientific Committee of the Risk Forum, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this ninth edition of the Risk Forum. Over the last years, we've been covering various topics, including liquidity risk, systemic risk, big data. 
but it is the first year that the conference is dedicated to investment and that we organize this new edition in partnership with the journal Bankers, Markets and Investors. The Risk Forum always had the goal to gather in the same place academics and practitioners in finance, and I am personally convinced that there is a lot to gain from fruitful collaborations between these two worlds to promote new ideas and new practices. We launched this new edition around three major topics, which are, I think are really crucial today for the investment management industry. The systemic risk of investment funds. After banks, now investment managers or some big assets owners are also now considered as potentially systemic by the regulators. So we'll have a panel discussion and, and a guest speech on that this afternoon. The rise of smart beta and risk factors as challengers of traditional indices. So this comes in the aftermath of the financial crisis as a new way to conceive asset allocation and the way we have been investing in traditional indices. And last but not least, the importance of institutional in ownership, voting engagement by institutional investors. So, as you know, asset owners are more and more exercising their ownership rights and with potentially very large implications for the funds they invest in. And of course, other to important topics will be covered as well during the event. So I hope you will enjoy it. And I would like to thank the members of the Science Scientific Committee for their insights and for their commitment in the organization of the event. In particular, I would like to thank Christian Gourierou, who has not only been of great support, but also always a source of ideas and inspiration for many of us. I also would like to thank Carole Allaire for her dedication in the preparation of the academic program of the conference. I now would like to introduce Jean-François Boulier. So Jean-François is the CEO of Aviva Investors France and sponsor of the conference. Jean-François has been a great supporter of the collaborations between research and practice in finance. He was a pioneer in that respect. And I discovered recently there is a name for people like you, you're pracademics. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> it's a contraction of practitioners and academics, and that's what is used in Australia. I learned that last, last week. <laughs> so I would like to thank you very much for your support on the, on the event. And Jean-François, the floor is yours for the introduction of the event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary, for your kind word, and especially the new words. <laughs> I'm delighted to, to be here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, these events are very important to, to us, Aviva Investor. We are sponsoring this event indeed, but it's very important also for all the asset management community here in France to uh, learn from uh, your studies, uh, learn from your inside and uh, foster the innovation on this very marketplace where we have lots of savings and uh, development. I would like to uh, introduce this uh, uh, great forum with three words. One is industry, second is research, and a third is not a word, but bridging the gap, which uh, I think you try and I have uh, tried myself uh, to, to do in many, uh, many cases. So a, a word on the industry, I think it's uh, important to uh, to, to set uh, uh, somewhat the scene. Uh, of course, we had a, a very big crisis in the, in the past, uh, uh, but uh, I think the industry, uh, of course, was uh, in the turmoil, but has bounced back uh, quite, uh, quite clearly. Uh, there's more than 600 firms uh, in France. Uh, there are about uh, 50 new entrants a year means that uh, it's a lively marketplace and thanks to uh, all regulators, thanks to uh, the support of uh, French authority, it's a, it's a very lively uh, marketplace. It's an important marketplace given the size of the savings in France. Uh, it's one of the, the places in Europe where we enjoy the largest savings, so it's a, it's a very important one. We have weaknesses, no pension funds and and, uh, and less institution, uh, less institution in investors than in other places, but uh, we still have a very lively and thriving industry. We have and we face uh, a number of challenges. Uh, after saying that we had the support of the regulation, we have to say that re regulation offers a few challenges to us. Uh, the, uh, 
expansion of uh, uh, the regulation directly to asset manager or to our clients with uh, uh, the regulation to, uh, uh, to banks and for, for us, uh, insurance companies, a new solvency too is really a challenge on, on many respects. Uh, so we have to face this uh, and we face also, as a uh, uh, previous uh, speaker said, uh, some unprecedented challenges in the marketplace. The first one is negative rates. Indeed, very low rate environment is a big challenge, especially uh, in, a, in a country like France where about two thirds uh, of the asset are bonds. So it's, it's really a challenge. The other challenge is the disappearance of uh, a number of uh, market, uh, market actors in, in the day-to-day uh, -day market. And so the uh, liquidity has uh, evaporated in, in many cases and is really a challenge uh, for, for, for us all, in particular for our clients when they, they want to redeem their, their assets. So, so all studies related to uh, uh, the new models for uh, negative interest rates, uh, to liquidity, how to manage it is really key for, for us. But uh, af after this uh, somewhat negative uh, mention, uh, I would like to send uh, a very optimistic message. Uh, we see more and more uh, new entrants in the market. I mentioned new asset manager, but we have also more and more fintech in, in Paris. And uh, this helps us and all clients to uh, do asset allocation, to uh, do trading, to do uh, uh, ga data gathering. And that's a, a very important and I think very useful uh, direction for, for us. The other element I wanted to, to mention is what has happened in research. Clearly, we see a renewal of research in factor investing. This was what uh, we were doing in the, uh, in the 90s. It has new words to describe it. It's maybe more marketing, but uh, it shows that uh, the smart beta and all that uh, uh, dig deeply into the research that has been done by many academics over the past. It's a good direction, I feel. I feel there's been more uh, research also on portfolio construction, and for us asset manager, it's really very important, especially a number of these portfolio construction are based on risk models, and, and from uh, the standpoint of uh, the, the crisis we've, uh, we've gone through, I think it's, it's a good lesson, and it's a good way to, to react to what happened. But there are also aspects, and I was very pleased to see a new research on parsimony and robustness. This is really key because one could feel comfortable having lots of data, but maybe this data is just noise. And uh, being able to tap into the real things, I was mentioning the factors, but uh, there are other aspects uh, to look at. So it's very important to, to find the right signal in the large amount of, of noise. I was also very pleased to see in the program lots of studies around liquidity. This was missing 10 years ago. I remember uh, being with uh, Bachelier and the uh, Finance Innovation in Paris and uh, requesting studies on, uh, on liquidity. They are there, so it's very good to, to see that. We need more. Uh, by the way, we are not the only one. Uh, two days ago, uh, the FSA in the UK uh, issued a, a study on corporate bonds liquidity. So that is really good. The more we have, uh, also down to uh, the savers, how they react towards the shocks in the market, how they redeem, what their behavior is really critical to enhance our practices uh, uh, on, on these things. What will happen with big data? I don't know. Uh, I remember that uh, uh, garbage in, uh, garbage out is, a, is something that uh, should, should be taken into account. So, uh, please offer all the necessary filters before there's too much excitement about wrong data, uh, bringing uh, wrong models, yes. So I would like to finish uh, with all uh, uh, the attention that is paid to bridge the gap between the practitioner and academics. Please say it again. Pracademic. We are all pracademic huh? here. Yeah. So this conference is really important. It's an achievement. It's the ninth in a row. 
Uh, it's the first on asset management, so that we are so pleased to, to sponsor it. But uh, it should not hide all the, the efforts that are in behind in Nepal innovation that started 10 years ago with all the effort of Rui Bachelier Center, uh, a lot of academics, a lot of practitioners uh, among uh, um, uh, my, my colleagues uh, and others from, uh, from abroad uh, are really participating into this endeavor and this is key for the, for the future. Uh, this is not the only uh, conference when you see uh, academics and, uh, and practitioner uh, meeting. Uh, we were a, a week ago in Amsterdam with uh, Inquire. There is a Quant Group in the US. There is a CQA. There's many. Uh, we are not competitors, I must say. We are here to foster uh, the relationship between knowledge and service because in the end, we need to have all clients benefit from the best of what is known and what we can do. So that is very important. At the scale of uh, the corporate body, Association Française de Gestion, we've just started a new initiative called Agoras, where we hear an academic or a practitioner uh, explaining uh, in front of uh, the peers, uh, asset manager, what kind of techniques we can use to enhance uh, uh, portfolio management. So the, the last one was on uh, uh, robustness and portfolio construction, and it was done by somebody from Lyon. So it's not a Paris-only uh, initiative. It's all over France that we want to develop uh, this uh, relationship. But certainly, the one uh, who needs our applause is, is Marie. And I would like uh, you to applaud her. <laughs> the work is not done, but, uh, but still it's for, for helping you achieve the, a great, uh, a great uh, forum. Marie is very active, uh, is one of the academic and practitioner journals, so a crack academic journal, if I understand well. And this journal has now more than 20 years in existence uh, and is dedicated indeed to convey uh, useful uh, techniques to, uh, to practitioners. So I encourage you to look at this uh, journal and cer certainly to submit. It is not for French only, it's uh, from all over the world that uh, you can submit uh, a paper, good papers, of course. Uh, I, want like, I would like to uh, finish with you. I think uh, this industry has forgotten that uh, the one, the most important, were people. So good practice, good professional, good academics are key to transform the world in, in, in which we're living. And your contribution, your question, your dedication to these subjects are very important. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, session, which is sponsored by uh, Natixis, on uh, systemic risk posed by uh, investment funds. And since we are regulators in the audience, finan uh, uh, financial regulation. The uh, overarching uh, questions is being asked is, are asset uh, management firm CIFIs, systemically important financial uh, institution? This is obviously a very controversial uh, issue. This is why we picked this topic for this, uh, uh, for this uh, session. Many articles have appeared in the financial press, many, uh, some of them mention explicitly uh, David Lawton and the um, FS FCA. And also since uh, September of uh, last year, US and the international um, regulators, uh, more the uh, OFR, the uh, Office of, the financial, of Financial Research in the US, IOSCO, the international organizations of uh, securities commissions, and more recently FSOC, the uh, Financial Stability Oversight Council, have released a report uh, suggesting that um, asset managers or funds that they offer uh, may be the sources of risk to the uh, overall uh, financial um, system. There are uh, opposite views on, uh, on these questions, and the presentation in this uh, uh, session will be a good illustration of how different viewpoints can be on, uh, on these questions. 
This session has uh, two parts. We we'll start with a half hour presentation uh, by our guest speaker, David Lawton, who is a director of uh, the markets division of the Financial Conduct Authority, the FC FCA. And uh, then uh, uh, the second part will be a panel session with uh, uh, viewpoints from asset managers, market makers, and uh, the French uh, uh, regulator. Uh, I will uh, introduce the panelists uh, in due time after the presentation of, uh, of David. Uh, David Lawton is, uh, again, as I said, director of the uh, market division at the Financial Conduct uh, Authority in, uh, in London. He's assumed his role since uh, July of 2012 and before joining the FSA in uh, January of 2005, the FSA being the predecessor to the uh, FCA. David spent um, uh, nearly 20 years at the, uh, uh, the Her Majesty's uh, Treasury uh, Department in, uh, in London. And David is an economist from uh, training with degrees from uh, Cambridge University and the uh, London, London School of, um, of Economics. Uh, David, uh, but before you, please come, and before you start uh, your uh, presentation, be uh, good for all of us here that you say a few words about the role of the uh, FCA and uh, the markets division that you're heading uh, there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Michelle, for that very kind uh, welcome. The FCA is the Financial Conduct Authority. It's the UK's conduct and uh, markets regulator, although we are also the prudential regulator of anything that's not a bank um, or an insurance company. Um, when I was invited to uh, speak at today's conference, I was asked if I would like to talk about the systemic risk posed by investment funds and the regulatory change that might be proposed to address those risks. Well, that would be an incredibly interesting and important topic, uh, and the FCA is certainly actively involved in the debate uh, at the moment, partly uh, in our role as a supervisor of the fund management sector, but also because we are a member of a number of uh, UK and international bodies that are discussing the question. But to be... Uh, uh, candid with you right up front, I will say that the regulatory work is not finished. We're still assessing the impact of the new post-crisis market conditions uh, and the risks that may, they may pose to uh, funds and fund managers uh, and vice versa. And it'll only be once those issues have been considered that we'll be able to think about what regulatory steps could be taken. And I note that some possible steps may in turn have consequences that we will need to think through too. And so I won't try and provide any definitive answers today as to what regulatory changes might be in store. But that said, I would like to do three things uh, in my remarks. The first is to set out some background to the debate. The second, I'll talk about market and fund liquidity and the work that's been done to try and understand those two issues. And then finally, I will give some perspective on the investor view. Uh, I think this has been something that perhaps has been missing from the debate so far. What's this debate all about? Where did it come from? Well, after 2008, the world was focused on the systemic risk embodied in large global banks. And rightly so. The case barely needed demonstrating that such institutions, if they were to suffer large losses, could fail and potentially bring wide and serious implications for other firms and financial markets. And with that case made, the focus then turned to potential solutions. Additional capital, bail-inable securities, structural separation, more stringent stress testing, greater disclosures, 
more effective resolution arrangements, and so on and so on. All possible measures to address the too big to fail problem in banks. And while that debate was still playing out, questions started to be asked about the systemic nature of other financial actors, so-called non-bank SIFIs or GSIFIs. Insurers were next in line, particularly given the lesson of AIG's losses. And then market infrastructure, in particular CCPs, clearly a critical part of the financial system, but a different business model that required different thinking from that for banks and insurers. And in the last two years, discussion has intensified around the role of asset managers and others that control private pools of capital for investment purposes. That's our focus today. So one reason asset management, and in particular the collective or mutual fund industry, has attracted attention is that it's a large part of the global financial system. The IMF estimates that the asset management industry intermediates assets amounting to around 76 trillion US dollars. That's around 40% of all global financial assets. A second reason for interest, as well as uh, being large, uh, is that as some will no doubt remember, there have been in the past some high profile failings of investment funds, long term capital management in 1998. And then more recently, the closure of the Third Avenue Focused Credit Fund. Both are interesting case studies. A third reason for a focus on asset managers might be the large and growing investment in collective investment schemes, including by retail investors. And I'll come on to this uh, a little bit later on. So the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, has been the main international forum coordinating the regulatory analysis and discussion of this subject, working very closely with IOSCO. In 2015, the FSB and IOSCO consulted on a set of proposed methodologies for identifying non-bank, non-insurers who should be considered systemically important, including both investment funds and asset managers. Now, a typical structure might see the manager and the fund company being separately owned and run, with the manager acting purely as an agent, managing the fund operations, sorry, uh, ex executing mandates, and then those controlling the funds, managing fund operations. And the proposed FSB and IOSCO methodologies aimed to identify both funds and managers whose distress or disorderly failure could cause dis significant disruption to the system. The FSB work also took into account the links that in exist between the fund and the manager. And the proposed methodology for undertaking an assessment of which particular funds might be systemic included five different impact factors. Size, interconnectedness, complexity, substitutability, and cross-jurisdictional activities. But following the consultation, discussions led to the FSB and IOSCO jointly agreeing to put this work on entity-based assessments to one side until further work had been done on potential market-wide activity-based solutions that would be applied in the first instance and whether such solutions could be identified. And this is where the discussion now stands. So let me move on to spell out in more detail the potential vulnerabilities which the FSB and IOSCO work has identified in its assessment to date. Vulnerabilities which might lead to systemic risks among these firms. Well, there are five. Firstly, 
the possible mismatch between the liquidity of fund investments on the one hand and the terms and conditions for redemptions on the other. Secondly, the high levels of leverage within certain investment funds. Thirdly, the operational risk and challenges that that might pose in transferring investment mandates from a fund manager that was failing to another manager. Fourthly, the securities lending, of asset, securities lending activities of asset managers and funds. And then finally, and slightly separately, the potential vulnerabilities of pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. Now, each of these vulnerabilities could lead to losses for investors in the fund, with potential impact on others and the market. Now, in terms of the leverage risk, that was the second risk I mentioned, it could be argued that banks who provide funding or act as counterparties to derivatives transactions are arguably now more protected than they were in the past. Improving risk management, more capital and other prudential measures, as well as central counterparty clearing of derivatives, have all helped to mitigate the risk of bank exposures. And a large number of regulated funds are not actually allowed to utilise leverage or have limits on the extent to which they can do so. But in addition to the risks for the individual players, there are systemic concerns which arise from the impact of losses and the impact of these losses on other counterparties. And this market impact is certainly worth further consideration. Because if some intermediaries have to rapidly liquidate a substantial amount of even liquid assets, it's possible that there could be broader declines in asset prices that could have further knock-on effects. So it's really important for us to understand how likely it is that each of these scenarios could arise, how big the impact would be if they did, and we need to reflect also on what is already in place to mitigate the probability of each risk crystallising and to cushion the impact if it did. So now the FSB has been working since early 2015 to explore the financial stability risks associated with stress market liquidity and asset management activities and then to assess the potential structural vulnerabilities therein. In September, the FSB signalled some of the risk vulnerabilities they've been looking at, as I have just noted. And as an interim step, the FSB encouraged the appropriate use of stress testing by funds to assess their ability individually and collectively to meet redemptions under difficult market conditions. And the FSB is now working alongside IOSCO to conduct further analysis and, as necessary, will develop policy recommendations in the first half of this year. Additionally, on the IOSCO side, it's worth noting that IOSCO has already previously published some authoritative principles for liquidity risk management for collective investment schemes, which are relevant here. And IOSCO is also looking into the questions of liquidity around comp corporate bond markets, flagging this as an important risk in its recent risk outlook. So 2016 will see continued exploration of fund and market liquidity issues by the FSB and by OSCO and also in the UK through the Financial Policy Committee. And while that work continues, I won't try and speculate on what the conclusions might be, nor on what further steps might be needed to help protect against the key vulnerabilities and risks. But I do want to talk about a couple of things that are very relevant to the analysis, fund liquidity and market liquidity. At the beginning of March, uh, at the FCA, we published the findings of some recent supervisory work with a number of large investment management firms, where we looked to, to see how they were managing liquidity in their funds. 
One concern is that funds are often marketed as offering, and indeed do offer, daily prices of the values of the units in the fund. So there's an expectation on the part of investors that they will be able to exit the fund immediately at the daily price. Now, of course, in practice, funds typically have to sell assets to meet these redemptions. So the question is whether those assets can be sold quickly to pay for the redemption, and if they can, at what discount to previously traded prices. Now, European uh, rules uh, apply to funds in this area, and they require good liquidity risk management across a variety of market conditions. As part of the recent work with investment management firms, we looked at how well uh, firms were adhering to these rules. And we actually found plenty of good practice in this space. Based on these findings, we've raised with the broader industry some positive steps that can be taken, including clear disclosure to investors up front about liquidity risk, subscription and redemption processes that are designed with the fund's investment strategy in mind, regular assessments being made of liquidity demands, gathering price data from a variety of sources, and then finally stress testing portfolios and possible redemptions in the light of a range of market conditions. The FCA will continue to look at these issues because we feel they're really important for the fair treatment of investors and market integrity as a whole. Now, many people in the industry argue that changes to financial regulation following the 2008 crisis have reduced market liquidity. First among these reforms, it's claimed, are the various changes to prudential rules which have increased the charge that falls on an institution holding assets like bonds on balance sheets. And in OTC markets, buy-side firms have perhaps previously placed reliance in the past on dealers holding large stocks of tradable assets, warehousing risks and therefore making continuous markets for those wishing to buy and sell. Research shows that the amount of corporate bonds held on balance sheets has indeed gone down. For example, the FCA's own regulatory returns suggest that UK dealers held around £400 billion of corporate bonds on their books in 2008, but just £250 billion, so down from £400 to £250 billion at the end of 2014. Now, of course, it's important that in any analysis of where we are today, we don't look back at the pre-2008 period as some sort of golden age that we need to get back to. That's definitely not the right benchmark. Secondly, it's not clear that current liquidity conditions have deteriorated to a point where serious structural issues have arisen, nor, if there has been any deterioration, what role financial regulation has played. Potentially, there are other drivers. The FSB, in its consideration of corporate bond market liquidity, has noted the need to recognise that a reduction in banks' trading activities was an intended objective of the post-crisis reforms and that the unsustainable excess liquidity prior to the crisis should not be used as a baseline for comparison. Now, none of this is to say that there are no risks around market liquidity. Far from it. And as regulators, we should be forward-looking and not backward-looking, thinking about how the risks to markets will evolve rather than what they were like in the past. Independently, two uh, FCA economists, colleagues of mine, have been an analysing the transaction data available to the FCA to see what these data tell us about market liquidity in the corporate bond market. They looked at data available to the FCA between 2008 and 2014. I won't go into full details about the findings. Uh, the paper is available on our website if you would like to explore it further. But the authors paint a sunnier picture than most about liquidity conditions up to 2014. 
finding that the fall in bond inventories that I mentioned earlier led, in fact, to no corresponding drop in liquidity. This is an interesting contribution to the debate, and it supports other authoritative findings too. But they obviously only capture the, the um, period up to 2014. It may be some time before we have a definitive conclusion as to what's really happening to market liquidity. But does this really matter for investors, and what role do they play in the debate? I'll start with what we can assume about retail investor behaviour. The increase in the participation in corporate bond funds has reportedly surged in recent years. This is clearly driven in part by low central bank interest rates, pushing down savings account rates and the corresponding search for yield among those with investable assets. Investing implies risk, though, and we should presume that investors have at least some awareness of risk, although it probably focuses around risk of loss. But any reasonable analysis of investor behaviour will also tell us that the average investor does not track fund portfolio performance day to day and does not pull out of such investments at the first signs of loss. This seems to be the experience. They are, on the whole, not professional or day traders. And as such, they're likely to ride out losses, unlikely to redeem from funds in response to immediate market news. But you also might expect professional investors, pension funds and insurers, for example, to act counter-cyclically, taking the long-term view and equally not cutting and running at the first sign of trouble. After all, they have long-term liabilities, which also benefit from patient investing over equally long periods. So such institutions' investment intentions may in fact see them buying rather than selling when assets become cheaper, helping to cushion the fall in prices. So there would seem to be some strong mitigants, both on the retail and the professional side, against the risk of rapid redemptions and the fire, si fire sale prices that I noted earlier. If this is the case, perhaps we need to reconsider how much market liquidity really is necessary in order for markets to work well for investors. An important angle for a consumer-focused conduct regulator is that funds provide the level of service that's promised and that investors could reasonably expect. Whilst regulators are not there to prevent investors from loss, we do look for those who run funds to manage their risks well and clearly disclose the risks that they run, disclose the types of assets that they invest in, and disclose their broad investment strategy and time horizons over which they do inspect to invest. These disclosures should be clear to the investor before they part with their money. The Third Avenue uh, example that I mentioned earlier is an interesting example because its stated investment strategy was to invest in very illiquid assets with the potential for high yields but also with the risk of a sharp loss. And this much seems to have been clearly disclosed to investors. Issues allegedly arose when the fund couldn't meet its redemptions in the manner expected and the fund had to close. It's incumbent on the fund and its manager to act in the best interests of all investors and we'll be checking whether investors are aware of and understand the potential liquidity risks as part of our ongoing work. So there's clearly some trade-off between protection from loss on the one hand and investor returns on the other. That has to be recognised and con recognised considering the likelihood of events materialising. If funds take a very cautious approach to being able to meet redemptions through, for example, holding large amounts of cash, this may make it more difficult to deliver 
high potential risk-weighted returns. It must be remembered that there has been no recent example of a shock large enough to trigger the sort of systemic risk scenario we've been discussing so far. But equally, the situations we're thinking about are not completely unforeseeable, and future market conditions could look very different from today. So as I have said more than once already, further analysis is needed. My point in this section is that good investor outcomes are a key consideration for markets that work well. So, to conclude, it is possible to imagine a set of scenarios in which a trigger event, for example, a sudden unexpected increase in central bank interest rates, or losses at one fund could cause knock-on effects for other firms and broader falling asset prices. There could even be some self-reinforcing factors that exacerbate this. A key vulnerability being discussed in the regulatory debate is whether funds have the ability to manage redemptions in an orderly way, particularly in the context of post-crisis market conditions, including risks to liquidity. I've said that the FCA evidence shows that funds have demonstrated some good practice at understanding and managing both the liquidity of their assets and the expected demands for redemption. And I said that the case is far from proven that market liquidity is now at low enough levels to be a dangerous exacerbating factor. And research from FCA colleagues is a contribution to the debate on that point. The picture of the systemic risks is still being drawn through the work of the FSB, IOSCO and others. Banks, insurers, infrastructures, asset managers, funds, all interact and can both exacerbate and mitigate risks and processes within the financial system in many and complex ways. And don't forget investors too. Ultimately, we mustn't forget the purpose of these markets, to serve the needs of investors. And that's the message I'd like to leave you with. Michelle, thank you. So you alluded a couple of times during the presentation to the closure of Third Avenue Capital last December. If I recall, it was a $800 million high yield fund offering daily liquidity while being invested mostly in uh, illiquid uh, assets. And uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that um, we should make sure that there is enough disclosure to, uh, to investors, but also should we impose some uh, uh, regulation to ensure that uh, the redemption policy of the fund is consistent with the liquidity of uh, the assets in, uh, in the fund? So I think there are two issues, aren't there? One is the systemic risk question, which I was focusing on uh, particularly in my remarks. Uh, and I think I would note that you know, the Third Avenue experience, whatever one may think about it, has not been a systemic shock. And therefore, whilst there might be some issues around that type of structure, that particular experience was not a systemic one. Clearly, it's important from an investor point of view that the investor understands what they are getting into. And I'm particularly uh, emphasizing that funds need to have very clear disclosures about what their investment strategy is and what their redemption policy is, and that they clearly have uh, mechanisms in place to be able to meet that policy. Thank you. My name is Jyoti Gupta. I'm Professor of Finance at ESCP Europe. My question is very simple. I think I know Jean-Francois who is sitting there. My question is very simple. FCA is responsible presumably to safeguard the investors in the investment management industry. One of the major components in that industry is obviously the pension funds. And as we all know, given the government constraints, the, we are moving from what we call uh, 
capitalization type of moving from repartition to capitalization of pensions, which is a general trend globally. What is FCA doing to ensure that these social issues are taken care of, where pension funds, where people who are coming and getting pensions, how do we ensure that they get a revenue and they are prevented from these shocks, systematic shocks that we talked about, including obviously liquidity risk? Because I think it's something very important. And it is a very important, and it is going to be more and more important as a social issue. I always feel a little bit nervous about professors who say they're asking a simple question. Um, I think it was de deceptively uh, simple. Um, it, a couple of, I, I can't possibly give a, a comprehensive answer to that question, but a couple, of, a couple of points that might be relevant. Firstly, in the UK regulatory structure, the FCA shares competence for um, uh, regulating uh, the pensions area with a pensions regulator who are responsible for slightly different things. But I completely agree with you that it's critically important for any type of long-term saving for the saver to have confidence in the savings channel. That's about uh, all the things we've been talking about today, really. It's about making sure that there is clarity, that the intermediaries are uh, well uh, financed and well regulated and well supervised and that the investors have um, appropriate um, advice. One of the things that uh, we have just done at the FCA in conjunction with our finance ministry is just conclude a review of the financial advice market. Uh, and one of the things that that review recommended was that um, pensioners should be able to dip into their pension funds to be able to fund advice as to how they would um, um, what they would do with the funds uh, once they um, became available for being drawn down. Thank you very much. Uh, as, you, as I mentioned, I read your studies on corporate bonds. I think it's really useful to have that kind of uh, empirical studies regularly. As you mentioned, these things evolve over time, uh, uh, getting a, a um, an idea of uh, what influence is uh, always uh, very helpful to prevent things from being worse, of course. I, I was wondering if you had similar studies on uh, retail behavior, uh, how uh, uh, individuals react to market shocks, uh, if you had uh, opportunities to see how to mitigate the shocks uh, uh, through education or, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, information to, uh, to them. Uh, I don't think the FCA has done any research on how individuals react to market shocks. Our, our focus in that space has really been around how individuals take investment decisions uh, and how they absorb different types of disclosures. So we've done a lot of thinking about insights from behavioral economics about, about decision making, but probably in non-stressed conditions rather than reacting to market shocks. But given that this is a room that is, I am clearly full of, uh, of, of, uh, of academics, that could be a potential research topic for, uh, for the near future. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, So to complement this, uh, the presentation of, uh, of, Dav of David, uh, we have um, a panel of uh, distinguished uh, practitioners and uh, regulators. Uh, <coughs> we'll have first a point of view of uh, the um, uh, active asset manager with uh, Philippe Bertelot, who is uh, head of credit and um, structured credit at Natixis Asset Management. Uh, then we'll have the, the viewpoint of the largest uh, ETF provider, uh, BlackRock, uh, with uh, Ed Fishwick, who is a global co-head of risk and um, quantitative analysis at BlackRock, and has a very strong uh, views, maybe uh, somewhat orthogonal to uh, uh, Philippe's uh, views, on the risk posed by um, ETF. Then we'll have the viewpoint of the market maker, with uh, Raoul uh, Salomon, who is the uh, head of uh, markets for France at uh, Barclays. 
And uh, finally, the uh, IMF, the, the French uh, regulator, will conclude with uh, Mrs. Uh, Dimitrig de Certine, who might tell us whether, uh, discuss the point of view of the French uh, regulator, the IMF, and if there is a need for further uh, regulation during an uh, episode of uh, uh, stress markets. Uh, for example, imposing uh, reserves to absorb uh, redemptions during episode of uh, illiquid uh, markets, uh, imposing uh, redemption uh, limits, pricing of uh, foreign shares in such a way that exiting uh, uh, investors do not pass uh, on the cost of liquidity to uh, the uh, remaining uh, ones. And um, to uh, introduce uh, the uh, discussion, um, I'd like to refer to uh, remarks uh, here from uh, my colleagues from uh, in capital markets, i.e. that uh, liquidity has uh, dried out, and uh, if investment funds are uh, exposed to herding behavior from uh, by asset managers and uh, and their investors, especially during an uh, episode of uh, uh, market uh, stress. The argument being that uh, if uh, some uh, investors is in some of the funds uh, start to panic and um, uh, try to exit at the same time, these funds will have to liquidate uh, big chunks of uh, securities are at the fire sale uh, prices, which will impact the net asset value, the nav, or the nav of otherwise performing uh, funds which in turn, for contagion, uh, might trigger further redemptions of many other funds, which will lead to a market uh, sell-off and uh, spiraling drops in, uh, in asset prices. Uh, the question of uh, why market liquidity has um, dried out is pretty controversial too. Uh, market makers point to uh, Basel III capital requirements, Dodd-Frank, the uh, Volcker rule as all uh, combining uh, effect negatively uh, impact uh, liquidity with banks, market liquidity, with banks withdrawing from, uh, from market making. On the contrary, the uh, recent report from the FSA you know, reaches uh, some uh, uh, opposite uh, conclusions, and Raoul Salomon will um, probably uh, you know, challenge uh, this, uh, this view. And uh, I will also mention, we, ma we mentioned the, the closure of uh, Third Avenue Capital, but there's also uh, the risk of a flash crash as uh, last August, when the, uh, after the decision from the Chinese authorities to devalue the, the yuan uh, during the weekend, and uh, the uh, New York Stock Exchange uh, had to delay the opening of, uh, of the market by uh, activating, uh, activating uh, circuit breakers, not only for stocks, but also for uh, ETFs. And uh, what happened is some uh, ETFs moved uh, away from their reference index by, uh, um, by more than 30%, you know, at, at, the, uh, at, the, at the opening. So there are opposite views on, um, uh, on whether uh, investment funds pose uh, systemic risk. There are several reports which uh, came out. Uh, one from the Brookings Institution, which cannot be taxed of lobbying for, for the banks. The, uh, the claim uh, being that uh, uh, the heterogeneous nature of, um, inv of mutual fund investors, uh, many of them being uh, buy and, and hold, uh, is such that asset uh, management firms we never pose a systemic uh, risk. With that, I'll uh, uh, leave, um, I'll uh, give the, uh, the podium to Philippe Bertolo from Natixis Asset Management. Thank you. I will have a brief discussion uh, with seven slides and five minutes to be punctual as a Frenchman, I think. Um, I'm very sorry for the people who like correctly or politically correct stance. I will disappoint them for the rest of the audience. You will like it, I'm pretty sure. Um, it has become a, a real fashionable topic, and Michel has alluded to it with uh, some closure of funds. And this time, it, op it, it occurs first in the US. Two funds closing in the US, one in the UK. Well, could say is a continental European 
manager, are we immune from that? It just happens elsewhere, but we all know that uh, financial markets are interconnected and uh, this reaction may be stupid. Uh, the story does to complete the explanation. Third Avenue is not a, a high yield uh, fund. It was a distressed strategy, investing heavily or heavily in triple C names or non rated names. The fund underperformed massively the markets, minus 30% versus minus five, and hence it has to face a lot of redemption. What was tricky was it was not a hedge fund with gates, it was a USIT with da daily NAV. This is why he faced uh, so much trouble. In the same time, by the way, it put the SEC into question because in the same time they are conducting a survey and we'll see the result of such a, a survey currently because the SEC has proposed six liquidity buckets for the fund management industry. Then we know that this time it happens uh, in the US first and uh, we'll see uh, so far we've not been impacted in continental Europe so far. Definitely a, a fashionable topic. Every investment bank has published a very appealing and compelling research paper about that, including official institutes like the IMF, the BIS. By the way, you have very few papers in French, like the AMAFI, which is uh, quite good, by the way. Uh, but definitely, a lot of people and market practitioners have drawn the attention from regulators because things have changed. But what's changed, in fact? When you look at liquidity, you have 200 people in the room. If I ask you, each of you, what liquidity means, you'll have 200 different answers. And this is why, at some point, you need to agree on something which is a benchmark for everybody. I like this one. Liquid market can be described as large, deep, fast, and smooth. The BIS uh, definition is uh, one of my favorite. This is a market where participants can quickly execute large uh, volume transactions with a small impact on prices. My own experience before the crisis, in 2006, everybody could buy one tenth, 10 percent of NA benchmark issue and size, 50 million out of 500 million in less than 10 minutes, the same day without any price disruption. Nowadays, 10 years afterwards, it demands five tickets of 10 million, of 10 tickets of five. It demands two or five days and may be impossible to achieve 25% of the time. This is facts. This is the reality. You cannot ignore that. I've a long time been a, an advocate for mark to market. The story is what's the significance, the worth of the mark when the market vanishes? It's been the case in summer 07, summer 08, and we'll have many more episodes of that. Why this time does it happen in the US? No need to be an MIT graduate for that. Again, why am I citing the US? Because in Europe, you don't have those kind of figures, unfortunately. In the last 10 years and more, when the US credit markets have tripled in size, inventories have collapsed by 80%. This is the reality of our credit markets nowadays. You understand why now the first closure of funds do happen in the US, definitely. We know that fixed income is an OTC market. It differs from equity. Credit has always been less liquid than anything else. Is it that true? October the 15th of 2014, you had a flash rally and a flash crash on the supposedly most liquid market in the world, the 10-year uh, ten treasury. It collapsed by 30 basis points in 70 minutes and then jumped by 20 uh, basis points just the hour after that. One chance out of three billion years, according to JP Morgan uh, CEO Jamie Diamond. They see the world we live in with more and more frequent fresh crashes or flash rallies. To assess liquidity, it's always been a, a, a trouble. In, in Europe because we didn't have sufficient measure. Again, look at the simple uh, calculus, no need to be a PhD in stochastic calculus, it's just a subtraction and a division. That simple calculus was not available in Europe uh, until 2010. Again, at the US experience there, 
a traditional LCS, which is a liquidity cost score made by Barclays, the average BDAX price, uh, shows the evolution of a typical corporate bond market. Aggregate corporate is the corporate sample from the US aggregate index, and the same for the US high yield. You would see that we have not moved back to uh, the liquidity level as measured by the BIDA spread, where it stood in 2007. If the liquidity is not the same, your alpha generation is not the same, then as asset managers, we had to implement uh, a new way of managing our active risk measure, but it's another story. Definitely, it has had a, 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 an Im a huge uh, impact on our uh, way to managing money. It has become an issue for every asset manager or every active asset manager in the world in the last five years. Can we have some solutions? Definitely, uh, being able to implement CDS uh, when you face credit issues is a way of make, uh, getting rid of a, of a corporate credit risk, but it doesn't fix the liquid stuff. Having ample cash buckets, five to 10%, where we used to have two or 3%, being able to implement anti-dilutive uh, pricing methodology. For once, the Europeans are in advance versus the US because in the SEC regulation proposal, they are proposing uh, swing pricing. Negotiate a backup liquidity line is some uh, uh, solutions made by Aberdeen Asset Management. For one, uh, it's been publicly uh, said. Uh, the SEC imposed in 2001, 2002, post-trade transparency called a trace system, which is paramount important for us and should be implemented under MIFID II. That said, the earning way is an issue. Uh, being able to publish daily NAV, is it worse for long-term investment? I began my career having monthly or weekly NAV calculation, whereas now daily NAV has become a standard from the pressure of sales or clients, but is it the best way? Uh, but we are, everybody's exploring solutions in order to avoid the closure of funds because you, nobody wants to appear to be the first one to do that. It has a reputation impact, definitely. But ignoring the fact that the market is less liquid than previously would be a, a, a gigantic mistake. The story for us is simple. In order to annihilate counterparty risk, Regulators have implemented tougher regulation, lots of reform. I used to call bankers the dirty bankers because I thought they were the reason for such trouble, but it's not the story. But they have let another bigger monster to come in. It's called liquidity risk. And liquidity risk may become systemic. Thank you for your listening. So we'll, uh, we'll follow with uh, Edouard Fishwick will give us uh, the point of view of uh, ETF uh, provider. So I, um, I, I agreed to uh, sit on this panel about three months ago because I thought, hey, it will be interesting. Um, I like Paris, so it'll be good to come along. Um, and then two weeks ago, um, I, I asked, you know, what would you like me to uh, talk about? I can talk about many, many things. And um, the request was talk about uh, ETFs and liquidity. And I thought, uh-oh, in Paris, that will be interesting. So I thought, OK, I'll go the whole hog and talk about fixed income ETFs in this context. Um, so I will be super brief. But before I go to these slides, let me just make uh, just two or three very high-level comments. So I think when we look at this, um, there's a few things that are blindingly obvious but sometimes kind of get lost in the mix. Um, and so the first kind of like high level comment is clearly you can make things safer. And within reason, in nominal terms, uh, in most situations, you can make things as safe as you want. But in general, the safer you make things, the lower the return will be. And that's a very, very simple trade off. So you can make things more liquid, you can make things less volatile, you can limit downside risk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but you will reduce returns. So that's the first thing. Secondly, um, there is a massive propensity in this, uh, in this space to conflate systemic and market risk. So prices going up and prices going down, 
that's what happens in markets. And if you are going to talk about systemic risk, you need to differentiate between the normal operation of markets and risks that are systemic, risks that impact the whole system. And then thirdly, in the context of liquidity, um, my personal observation here is this is a very difficult subject. And, you know, there's this kind of like sense in which what people want to say is they want to say there's some demand for volume, there's some demand for trade. That translates into price impact and the thing that links them is liquidity. And when liquidity is high, the price impact is low. When the liquidity is, you know, small, the price impact is big. And academics in the audience will know that many of the academic or measures of liquidity you find in the literature assume that functional relationship. But of course that is disastrously weak. And it's disastrously weak because that linkage from the desire to trade to price impact is a function of many, many things. So in a world of time-varying risk, of time-varying volatility, of rapidly changing sentiment, in a world where you know what many other market participants are thinking, you're seeking to second guess their actions, to kind of lump everything as liquidity when you think about that relationship between the desire to trade at a given volume and the impact on prices in the market, in my view, and I think in our view, that is a gross simplification. So fixed income ETFs. So basically what this slide says as follows. Um, Bond market liquidity has changed. I think our kind of high level take when we look at our activities globally is that we can still do everything we want to do. We can still do everything we used to be able to do in terms of trading in bond markets, uh, but it's different. Um, block sizes are unambiguously smaller. They might be up to 75% smaller actually in some cases. Um, it can take a bit longer. Um, there are you know, I think different stories you can tell about ETFs. Um, and in many ways, when we look at fixed income ETFs through many bouts of volatility, even in recent data, even last December, what we see is ETFs absorbing uh, a lot of demands for liquidity, a lot of demands for trade. We see ETFs damping down um, volatility in that context. I think, I think that's actually unambiguously the case in, in, in that case. Um, and the other kind of high level thing you need to think about ETFs in the fixed income space is that a lot of people hold bonds. And the bond market is complicated. Um, you have very disparate holders with you know, massively differing objectives and time horizons. You have sovereign wealth funds, you have pension funds, um, insurance companies. And so bonds are held by lots and lots of people. And uh, to date, at least, uh, the size of ETFs and indeed the size of funds generally in this context is very small. And so I've got some data. Um, this is like one of the most used charts in the world. So the previous speaker had this chart. Everybody has the same chart. And they kind of show it slightly differently, but it's the same chart. And that just says that, you know, primary de dealer holdings have fallen dramatically. Uh, this, of course, is at a time when AUM has gone up. Now, there's a profound question as to whether that matters. There's a profound question whether any of that inventory ever actually smoothed prices other than inside the BNR spread. Because the last thing a market maker ever did was put capital on the table when they thought prices were going to fall rapidly. That was always suicide. They never did it. That's why throughout the whole of financial history, there are episodes of prices falling rapidly. Um, that one on the, uh, the right is interesting. That's just the ratio between the volume outstanding in investment grade and the amount of turnover, and it's fallen. So if you want just a you know, simple piece of empirical evidence that this stuff is more challenged than it was, there is one. This kind of like brightly colored chart is about who owns bonds. And uh, basically, you know, there's a whole bunch. This, this is US data, by the way. And you can tell that because it talks about foreign owners and foreign bonds. That's because it's from a US perspective. But, um, you know, the, the takeaway here is that little red sliver at the top is ETFs. So that's the kind of 
the debt market, and ETFs are a tiny pie. And, um, you know, the turnover is very dynamic in ETFs, which is why they are actually volatility damping in many situations. Uh, but, but, but nonetheless, the amount of assets in that space is very small relative to holdings across the piece. So I'm just going to go quickly here. That's about the rise in ETF turnover. And so, you know, one of, one of the unambiguous things is that the, the percentage of daily volume accounted for by ETFs and the, and the turnover has increased significantly, all of which actually improves liquidity. You know, if you don't think about ETFs very often, remember that when you trade ETFs, you're trading ETFs, you're not trading the underlying. And this last slide here, um, that is the daily volume of traded ETFs in the fixed income space on the left. And that spike there is the big sell-off in uh, high yield in December. And you know what you saw there was a huge amount of volume in the exchange traded fund space but that was people trading with each other with no recourse to the underlying. So that's about absorbing vol, that's about price discovery, and uh, you know that in a sense from a evolving ecosystem in the bond market is an important piece of data. That bond markets have changed, you know, and, and, and our sense is ETFs are far from the whole story. There's a huge amount of stuff that happens in fixed income that is unrelated to exchange traded funds, but nonetheless, through a number of risk episodes, vol episodes, um, they have you know, behaved exactly as predicted and exactly as you would want, and that kind of dynamic propensity to absorb uh, demands for liquidity is an important property. So there's a lot more I could say, but I'm gonna stop there for now. So after having listened to uh, the point of view of the asset manager, we turn to the uh, viewpoint of the market maker. So first of all, I want to apologize to, to be the banker. Someone, <laughs> someone have to do the job. So and please don't shoot the messenger. So you know to talk about uh, asset management and uh, the risk posed by uh, the asset management. I thought that basically that will, uh, basically I will just talk about what I'm doing every day, all day long, which is to talk about liquidity. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading, I've read the FCA paper, I've read the IMF paper, and sometimes I just say, why are we talking about the same world? You know, all day long, I'm complaining, you, I, I got complaints regarding the liquidity. So, uh, first of all, uh, as we have said, we are talking about 7 billion um, US dollar um, industry, we are talking about something which is 100% uh, percent of the GDP. And uh, if we look at the background of all this story, obviously, we start to, to regulate the bank, which I think was a good idea. Then, you know, we move from Basel I to Basel II. Then we say, oh, we should look at insurer. So Solvency II appear. Then obviously, you know, you all know what Solvency II is about. It's basically at the end. Uh, that means more demand for fixed income. Okay, everybody wants to buy, to buy more and more fixed income. Then obviously, Basel III came also. And then we start to look at very, very much the capital of the, of the banking industry which now we are waiting for the, the uh, non-bank, non-insurance uh, financial institution, which should be, I think, the end of the circle. I don't know if it's the end, but I, at least that will be the, the circle. So if I look at the background of all this thing, which that's why um, you know, sometimes I, I get the feeling that we are talking about different things. All, not every day, but you know, the, the, the new trend is basically there is less and less market maker. You know, the most liquid market, which is supposed to be the, the government bond market, we are seeing some banks who are basically are stopping the, the activity. So this thing, there is a lot of publicity because in order to get premier dealer with a government, you need to publicize it. And when you stop, you also need to declare it. So what we have seen is uh, Deutsche Bank have stopped Belgium. Credit Suisse have stopped all primary dealer except uh, US. Um, some, you know, they have, some have also Quit Ireland and uh, Societe Generale have stopped to do the guilt. Uh, that this thing is very very public. It was uh, on newspaper. But if you look, if you go in the credit market, you know that more and more banks are stopped to do single name in CDS and this kind of thing. It's all day long. So you know the thing is we need to realize that you know Basel III to, and that's not my study. You know it's Oliver Winman. In order to do rates or credit, basically you need five or six times more capital. 
And as you may know, we are looking desperately to increase the return of our capital, which means to increase revenue and to decrease the, the, the capital. So if I look, you know, I, to be honest, I, before to come, I've just, what kind of study that I, was, I was able to read regarding um, systemic risk and investment uh, industry. There is tons of literature regarding the um, banks, the banks, bankrupt, banks bankruptcy and insurance company, but very, very few for, uh, for investment funds. The only thing which have been uh, focused are, are obviously LTCM, where we all know that all the story regarding LTCM. So if we look at what's happened, you know, what kind of systemic risk we have, I would say there is two types of risk, the counterparty and, and uh, credit risk, and also the asset liquidation, as Philippe was mentioning. So can we have a new LTCM? Obviously, it's, this thing can happen, but we'll have the same impact. You know, there is so, some standard markets now, which the fact that everything is with margin call, which means that if something happens, we know exactly how to deal with it. So a new hedge fund, a new big hedge fund can collapse, or investment fund, but I guess it will be, t uh, it will be done in a different way. So now if I go to the, uh, to the uh, asset uh, liqu uh, liquidation and li liquidity risk, as I said, you know, everybody's looking to buy fixed income. Everybody's looking to buy bonds, and obviously yields are going down. So it's a little bit like, you know, in search of the lo uh, lost return, if I may quote Marcel Proust. Uh, so the evolution of the, uh, as Philippe was mentioning, so the, the market value of only the Euro credit market basically have doubled in less than, than 10 years. Okay, so that's one thing. And if I go in the, um, you know, there is more and more disintermediation. What that means is, you know, banks with, in the Euroland were supposed to finance 80% of the economy are now more to, close to 70, which is exactly the opposite. So what we are seeing these days is, this thing is only corporate bonds. When I say corporate, there is no financials, okay? So this thing is corporate, that the number of deals and the average uh, size of the deal. So if we just, 09, 09 and 10 were kind of strange years, but basically there is more and more deal and they are bigger and bigger. Okay, at the same time, you know, in order to do, to do market making, so before to talk about market making, if I go deeply in this number, so if you, what I have done is basically I've looked at who, who were buying the bonds, okay? So these corporate bonds, once again. So in 2006, so it's very, very difficult when, rec when you receive order from clients to do a difference between what is an asset manager and what is, what is an insurer, because very, very often asset managers are managing money for an insurer. So I think it's easier to, to talk about the real money community, which is basically the retail, the asset manager, insurance, and, portfolio and pension fund. So an average deal, an average corporate deal in Euroland in 2006, there is about 70% who are bought by real money, which can be, we can say, by an old investor, opposite to fast money. If you look what is happening since 2010, 94% is owned by, uh, by an old investor, which means that basically there is, no, money, there is no, no allocation for fast money, which means that everybody is in on the same way. I, I don't know if you realize what that means. It's, for example, that for the market makers, for basically there is no allocation, so as Barclays, if I do a deal for whoever, the corporate, basically my market maker will have no, no bonds, which as you can imagine, is a little bit difficult to do market making without bonds. 99% of the, of the time, the hedge fund don't even try to put an order because they know that they will get zero. So, and, and to be honest, at the end of the day, I got complaints from all the asset manager. I wanted 200 million, you give me 12. That's part of my job. So that is, you know, when I, we, we talk about liquidity, Everybody's complaining of what they get, but on the other side is obviously in order to do market making, I need capital. And what I have done is obviously I show you the evolution of the European bank um, assets, which have decreased. Okay, um, Philippe was showing you this, I think, very, very interesting graph regarding uh, premier, uh, premier dealer net position that is in US, but it's about the same obviously uh, in Europe. So as you can see, there is an asymmetry Everybody wants to buy more and more bonds, but basically we are in a situation it's more, there is less and less people who wants to quote that or who are able to quote that. So, you know, if I, if I may, the, uh, the question is how to stop a high speed train. Okay, so we have huge demand, but nobody is able to quote on it. 
And just, you know, I didn't know that uh, Philippe will show this uh, LCS, liquidity uh, cost score, which is basically just the cost to do a round, tra round trade, you know, buy and sell. So we are doing study on this thing since, I think we have started to collect data in 98 or something like that. And uh, roughly 91% uh, of the Barclays uh, Global Aggregate uh, you know, uh, index is followed on, this, on a monthly uh, basis on this LCS. And what we have seen is obviously the situation is much, much better than in 2009. But you know, we are miles away of what we have before the crisis. I'm not so sure that that was, as David was mentioning, that, that is what the, the good situation, but at least people were able to buy and sell. So, and if I, if I look what will be the future, now you have to realize that ECB will start to go in the corporate bond market. So, which means that, you know, we are not able to give enough bonds for asset uh, manager, but now the ECB wants to buy. Okay, and I can tell you that it's, the, the way that people are sensitive to the price, ECB, the sensitivity of ECB is not, you know, what, uh, the one of an asset manager. So you can imagine how will be the liquidity, knowing that ECB obviously will keep, keep the bonds. After having listened to these uh, somewhat provocative uh, comments, it would be interesting to uh, listen to the point of view of the regulator, uh, the IMF, with uh, Mrs. Uh, Dossertin. Thank you very much, Mr. Khoury. Well, I'm actually a bit concerned because I don't have much more things to say. <laughs> because as you heard from... Uh, from David Lote and the international organizations are still working on this topic, so there's not so much that I'm able to share with you today, unfortunately. And then I think you heard from um, highly knowledgeable market practitioners their uh, point of view about the state of, of the liquidity on the markets today. So, well, I could very well stop here, but um, I'm going to share with you a couple of high-level comments. Yes, today our concern is about the liquidity on open-ended bond funds. So I'm not going to come back on the causes of these concerns. You know very well, I think you've heard it uh, many times over the past few months because it's, as my colleagues just said, it's a very trendy topic. So you had this rise of, uh, um, of, uh, of the, um, how, how do you say, the issuance of bonds, which led to a significant growth of bond funds. And at the same time, you had those concerns that were expressed on a reduced liquidity on the fixed income market, mainly due to the withdrawals of banks from their market making activities. So that's the general storyline we, that we're hearing pretty much everywhere for about one year now. International organizations such as the FSB and IOSCO have indicated that they are working actually on this topic. David Lauren very well described what we are doing at the moment. But let me share my point of view on this. One thing that strikes me, because at the AMF we've been meeting with a lot of market players to understand their view about market liquidity. And one thing that strikes me, it's depending on the angle from which you're looking at the issue, the stories may vary quite significantly. For instance, if you look at the figures, and we at the AMF have recently issued a study of the French bond market's liquidity between 2005 and 2015. And what we, we find is that apart from two episodes of strong decline of market liquidity, which are obviously the 2007-2009 crisis and the 2011 crisis, well, the level of liquidity on the French bond market has actually improved quite steadily since 2012. So that's one thing. If on the other hand you look at the bank's inventories, that's another story. Yes, the corporate bonds um, holdings of banks have considerably shrinked over the past few years. And then if you talk to market players, you have also very different feedbacks, depending on who you are talking to, on the markets they operate in, whether it's in Europe or whether it's in the US, whether they are buy side or sell side, depending on the size as well, and depending on whether they have some internal trading desks, you can get very different feedback. So our takeaway from this is that we need to have some further studies and to work more in the data that we have to have a more comprehensive picture of the liquidity risk. 
although we acknowledge that there is no single data point that can accurately measure the liquidity risk. But yes, we have these divergent views. And so the question that we are asking ourselves is why is that so? Why do these people think differently about this issue? And our interpretation, based on the numerous outreach that we've conducted over the past few months, is the following. So on the long run, we have the market that is undergoing some structural changes that may have some impact on the liquidity. And here I'm referring basically to these changes in the market making business. You have the rise of electronization of trades, the rise of trading platforms, banks withdrawal from market making activities, but yet these developments are still at an infant stage. They are clearly not filled the void left by banks yet. So yes, we're looking at these evolutions very closely because they may raise some regulatory questions in terms of price formation mechanism, in, ter in terms of fragmentation of prices across the markets. You, so yes, we're looking at it very closely with the view to accompany these developments while properly monitoring the risk that they may involve. That's a structural long-term change, and it's not necessarily bad. But in the short term, we are evolving today in an extraordinary conjuncture, which significantly magnified this problem of liquidity. This is the result of several years of accommodative monetary policy. Basically, we've opened the liquidity tap, while at the same time, banks were in the process of deleveraging, and the economic growth remained subdued. These are the perfect conditions to create misallocations of capital, asset misvaluations, and so on and so forth. That's where we are now. We know that a significant share of the markets are misvalued. So we often refer to the high yield markets, emerging markets. But why not talk about the $5.5 trillion government bonds with negative yields? That's the situation where we are today. I think it was Chuck Price from Citigroup who said about liquidity during the past crisis that the thing with liquidity is that when the music is playing, people keep on dancing. But that's when the music stops that things start to get a bit complicated. Today, central bank monetary policy music is still playing. So things are okay. But as one of them, and not the least, has started to turn down a little bit the sound, things have already started to get a bit complicated. I believe those um, hurdles have been visible on the market since the, since the beginning of the year through the very erratic behaviors of financial markets across the world. It's common now to wake up in the morning and learn that Asian markets have plummeted 5%, then the EU markets follow and wait to see what will do the opening of Wall Street, not to mention the hold your breath behaviors before each central bank meeting. This has become the new normal, yet this is very much uncharted territory. And the players had to adapt to this new environment, as we heard from the panelists. So we have these true driving forces, both in the long term and in the short run, that may have some impact on liquidity. And what is our position as securities markets regulators? Our role as regulator is to ensure that the players have the appropriate systems and process in place to evolve in this changing environment. We need to ensure that they constantly keep an eye on these market developments and that they are well prepared to adjust to them quickly. This implies that they have the liquidity management process in place to monitor the liquidity of their investments on a daily basis. But we also believe that the liquidity management is closely intertwined with the issue of asset valuation. And we expect that in this uncertain environment, market players are adopting some conservative approach when valuing their assets. So that's one part, daily liquidity management. But this also implies that the market players don't take the current situation as granted and make the effort to imagine how their portfolio would react to market shocks and what kind of decisions they would take to preserve the liquidity profile of their funds. That is why we strongly encourage players to regularly conduct stress testing both on markets and liquidity risks. We've met with a number of players over the past few months to have a better understanding of the existing practices. And we will be shortly in a position to issue some guidance about stress testing in order to ensure 
a level playing field across the industry. Finally, our role is to ensure that managers have the adequate tools available to manage their liquidity under all circumstances. We have an interesting debate at the moment on the benefits and drawbacks of each of these liquidity management tools. It's worth noting that the AFMD and USITS framework are very comprehensive in this regard. And it, I think it's fair to say that Europe is often regarded as a very good student in class at the international level on this liquidity management topic. In some conscious of time, I would just like to conclude by saying that liquidity risk is a very complex issue that needs to be appraised in light of the current market environment. And while it's true that the asset management sector has never known a bank-like brand behavior, apart from the notable episode of the US money market funds in, during the last crisis, we need to be very vigilant in the current environment about those potential risks. So before we open up for questions with the audience, <coughs> I, can, I may ask uh, the panelists to um, comment on what has been said or uh, response to uh, some of the presentations, audio presentations. This is for my regulator. We've got every quarter, let's say, uh, dinner with head of credits or if you can come, everybody in the same table do complain about liquidity. It's been the same case in the last three years in a row. Incidentally, AMF has made, uh, well, some meetings with large asset managers like us. We appear to be one of the pessimistic. My question is, were the people that you interviewed were in line with what they are doing or do you think the people have, uh, have, have lied on the purpose? So yeah, we, we've met with a number of players, both from France, from Europe, and from the US, so we're not regulating all of them. <laughs> so that's an important point. And it's true that we've had some very different feedback. It was actually interesting because in last December, we held a round table with some US and European players, and the result was quite interesting because actually the asset managers were quite confident about the liquidity, the level of liquidity. And so they were telling us that basically liquidity is there when you put the price and it, it was just a question of price. And the market makers were a bit more anxious, let's say, and were saying that uh, basically open-ended funds were now um, being subscribed by people that were not very... Um, able to bear the losses that could potentially be associated with such investments. So it was, it was quite interesting, but I think this round table was a bit, um, it was not representative of everything that we heard, because on the other hand, we had also some players that shared a lot of concern and that told us that now they could not uh, pass their orders and they had to slide their holders a, a lot more than before. I believe that was in, in, uh, in your presentation. So our takeaway was that the situation may vary quite significantly about depending on the size of the player because they told us that basically those that told us that if you put the price you can get the liquidity also told us that they have had a very close dialogue with their counterparties to determine exactly to which counterparty they could sell what and at what price and in which quantity. So I believe this is more um, when, you have, when you are a larger player, you can have uh, this facility to have this closer dialogue with a lot of different brokers that you may not have when you, ha you are a bit smaller. Yeah, so, so just briefly, um, you know, I think there's been several comments about the role of liquidity risk management. And I think, you know, in truth, um, in history, there wasn't a great deal of that. There wasn't a great deal of focus on the need to manage liquidity risk aggressively. Uh, and some of those last comments are part of that, actually. The need to understand where liquidity exists, um, the need to understand counterparty relationships, and so on. So, so, so that's a big piece of this. Um, and then, and then I think the, the other kind of really interesting question is, is that three of us actually showed the same data, the same chart, and this is around the massive decline in primary dealer capital allocated to market making. And, you know, I, I, I do think that one of the 
central, central questions here is to what extent does that matter? So we're kind of telling a story which is liquidity, you know, in many ways doesn't seem that challenged. And, you know, I think you've done work, others have done work. From our perspective, that's also the case. And yet you have that massive change in market, in, in market structure, market conditions. And so I, I, I think, again, a kind of key question out there is what does it mean to have a decline in dealer capital of that form while AUM and holdings increase massively? And yet it seems as though, at least to date, liquidity conditions are not significantly impaired. Having listened to all these uh, viewpoints, some of them being uh, conflictual, I'd be interested now to listen to uh, you know, a uh, question from the audience. Yes, the, just as you were mentioning a minute ago, you show the same great decline in dealer inventories. Uh, it, it's puzzling to me as to whether that translates into a disruption in liquidity. I mean, people are free to provide liquidity if they get paid for it. Is there something that's keeping that from happening? That's uh, you know some market failure or something? Because otherwise, why don't people step up and provide the liquidity? Or maybe they're already doing it in other technological ways rather than holding dealer inventories. But, I mean. No, the ob obviously, you know, we need more and more capital to do it. And basically what's uh, all, uh, all, st uh, all the studies are showing that basically we have increased bid offer spread on everything, you know. And this story regarding liquidity is not, on, as I said, only in credit. All the different DMO uh, in the world are, you know, the debt management office are, are looking at it. And, uh, you know, if you, uh, two weeks ago, I was auditioned at the, uh, with several other premier dealers at the French National Assembly, where they are also thinking about what is happening to our debt. And we, it's it's more and more difficult to do market making. That is the that is you you need more and more capital, and it's more and more costly. So we you know we try to basically to give the liquidity where we can. And there is also the fact that uh, we didn't mention it. The repo market, when yields are at zero, it's a very very strange market because there is you know there is a lot of fail, there is a lot of market this, this you know problem uh, com coming with ma when uh, yield are negative or at zero there is no in incentive to deliver a bonds where yield are at zero because the incentive is you don't basically you don't use the cash who cares it's zero so there is tons of things who are coming like that which make the market making more and more difficult and so we, we you know if you remember what happened in 2011 with the italian and, and spanish bonds you know I don't know if a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, investment fund can stand, you know, this thing that you have buy at par, suddenly trade between 50 and 60, and basically there is nobody who wants to buy. That's why ECB have to stand up and say, okay, I will buy everything and I will keep on hold. So, you know, obviously, as everybody have mentioned, it's a question of price, but is it an industry who can basically stand that suddenly the bonds, you know, the price is divided by two? That's what we, I think we are talking about. If tomorrow people wants to start to s sell big size of corporate bonds, what they have bought basically the last five years, not so sure that there will be someone in front of them. You, you mentioned the electronic electronization of trades. Can you maybe expand on a little bit on that? How in, in what direction is it going? And uh, is it going to improve liquidity? For, so what's your view on that? Because I think there is a need for uh, electronic platforms, maybe. What's your view? So yeah, I mentioned this as a long-term structural trend because I think, and well, that's the feedback as well that we had from the, our outreach exercise is that in the end, it might end up by filling the void left by banks in their activities of market making. So that's an interesting um, development. Here at the moment, we're, as mentioned, at an early stage of this development because as you know, um, fixed income markets are mostly OTC. They are not standardized. So it's complicated. You have some very well-known um, market players who tried to um, launch some corporate bond platforms and that failed because they thought they were big enough to have uh, enough supply and demand on their platform, but it failed in the end. So we are still at very early ch stages of this electronization. Nevertheless, we think that in the long run, it may prove useful and I'm not sure that it's actually a bad thing to be moving from a system where you had a handful of market players that used to be the cornerstone of the system and used to have access to so much information that they were 
in the position to make the prices to a new system where you have some so-called all-to-all platforms where the supply and the demand can participate to the price formation mechanism. So it's still early stage, but we have confidence that it will perhaps uh, help resolve this issue of market making. And the new MIFID directive will um, provide for some new requirements and we, that we hope will, will help the development of these platforms. If I may, just regarding um, electronic trading, the numbers are, because we, uh, I can talk about hours about this subject, we are a very big player on this thing. 90% uh, of the number of tickets, number of tickets, are done electronically. But that's 10% of the volume. 90% of the volume, I don't buy those because it's big size and nobody wants to show it in electronic. So that is a challenge. So obviously that's for everybody, it's just you know, fantastic because 90% of the ticket you have nothing to do and the tickets are so small who you don't care. But the big ones, the <laughs> in terms of volume, this one are done by voice, okay? And, and also the, the fact that you know, if we compare it to, to an exchange, I don't know how many you know, um, stock there is on, on an exchange, but only the, only the Barclays, Barclays Global um, Aggregate who are talking about 19,000 bonds, 19,000 bonds. So it starts to be a big exchange. Um. I'm not sure we've uh, had answered the, the question whether uh, investment funds are systemic or not, but at least it was quite interesting to uh, listen to many different uh, viewpoints from different sides of the market, the asset managers, the market makers, and, uh, and the regulators. And so we'll have uh, plenty of uh, uh, food for thoughts afterwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>